because he's got an eye condition that that means he needed transplant surgery in both eyes he was classed as blind so he didn't he knew that he was in the vicinity but he couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was mm. now if he'd gone to that appointment and he wasn't allowed to go to that appointment he would have had his transplant surgery before the trial and i think if he'd had that surgery before the trial there'd have been no denying that he was blind and the jury would have known because you don't give transplant surgery to someone that can see. In total, how many years did he serve? Was it 12 and a just half? A, or? Just, over thir- just over 13. Yeah, we, we always knew there would be restrictions and that he'd have to follow a licence uh, because when you do get a life sentence, it, it is 99 years and you are subject to a, to a licence that's put, 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 um, that's put in place by the parole board. Um, <clears throat> But uh, the extent of this license is huge. Yeah, Baroness yeah. Newlove will put to the parole board um, what her fears are and her thoughts, but it's always undisclosed. So we don't know what these are. And the story was being sort of repeated in the press as part of the broken, broken Britain rhetoric. Uh, and uh, she was rewarded uh, with a place in the House of Lords and, and a position of power. She then became the Victims Commissioner of England and Wales. It was August 2016. Um, Jordan was out with his brother and his friends. It was, it was going to be the last time that he came to Warrington. And he'd been at my house um, doing some jobs around the house for me because I had a house in Warrington as well as one in Wigan. Uh, and we were going to get the house ready to rent it out to someone. But um, on the Saturday evening, um, before he came home, there was an incident on Station Road in which a man died. And I'm always mindful of that. Of course, a man died. And, it, you know, that, that's the tragedy. Um, <clears throat> but Jordan wasn't involved in it. Um, Gary Newlove came out of his house to to, um, to to accost some young people that he believed had, had caused damage to a mini digger further down the road. But the young people that had done that had already left the scene. So when he's confronting the, the young people that he did, they were Jordan's friends. So it, as, as you can imagine, they're, they're saying, no, we didn't do it. And they're moving further up the street to get away from him. And is Jordan, um, Jordan's with them at that time? Well, the thing is with Jordan is he because he's got an eye condition that that means he, he needed transplant surgery in both eyes. He was classed as blind, so he didn't. He knew that he was in the vicinity, but he couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was. Uh, and because the, the the young people were sort of spread out. Uh, because they don't walk down the street in a collection of 10 people. They sort of, you know, in threes and fours and twos and whatever. He he wasn't aware of, of the incident until it had ha- already happened. So, and because it was a, a very swift incident as well, between 10 and 30 seconds in total, um, he didn't hear it because he felt that he would, must have been further away from it. <clears throat> was it night time as, as well, Jan? It, it was in the dark as well. And yeah. if you bear in mind that Jordan's sort of hanging away from the rest of them because he's, he's eating his chips so that, so that the other kids can't pinch them off him. He's hanging away so that he can eat his food um, and then catch up with them. But um, in the dark, it's, it's because of the street lighting, it would be quite chaotic. The way that he sees would be quite chaotic. So I would imagine... He's more concerned about not bumping into a lamppost than he is, uh, you know, a, a, about other things. He, he has to navigate himself in a, in a difficult difficult area. Um, is, is there so any he'd way be you... more concerned about himself rather than uh, everything and what everyone else is doing. OK. Is there any way that you could describe for us what it feels like for him with his vision? I mean, how much does he how how does he explain how he saw at that point, because I think he's had transplants since, hasn't he? So he, yeah. Bit, yeah. But but when he was there, that that fifteen year old boy in that street, in in you know in the in the night time, 
What was his vision like? Well, it's quite telling, really, because at that age, and and this was new to him. He was newly blind. It wasn't it wasn't something that he'd been dealing with for all of his life. It was it was quite new to him. Right. Uh, but also, he was fifteen years old, so he didn't have the sophisticated language. Uh, needed to explain it in the way that it was and I didn't know either you know it was only after his conviction after doing a lot of research and coming across someone in America who sort of explained how it how Jordan would would see so we didn't even have the opportunity to put that to the jury at trial but um, it's kind of the street lighting any light that you would see would look like starbursts Mm -hmm. um if you like, sort of the light would fall. So you've got the light up there, which you and I would see as a, as a single ball of light. But for Jordan, that ball of light would then become sort of almost like fireworks, if you like, falling to right. the ground. So if you've got half a dozen street lights on the street, it's almost like you're walking through, you know, a light show, if you like. Um, <clears throat> but that light doesn't make seeing things any better. Because, you know, even if you hold your hand up to Jordan, he would perhaps know there was something there, but he wouldn't know that it was a hand or how many fingers were on that hand. So everything was totally blurred. And, and another thing we, we found out afterwards as well, because he asked, he, he watched the Paralympics and was quite sort of curious about how you could be a blind cyclist. And he, <clears throat> he asked one of, one of um, his optometrists, you know, what percentage of vision do I have? And it transpires that it was less than 10%, which, you know, it, it was less than some of the Paralympic Olympians who were, right. you know, so, you know, um, it, it was it was really bad. It was really bad, yeah. Mm. So he was, he was walking along slightly separate from the others. And can you just recap the incident itself? Because there was a fracas, wasn't there? And um, Yeah, the, yeah. Can you just, just summarise what happened? We don't well, need to go into detail. In, in short, in short, I mean, this is what came up, you know, during the trial. Adam Swellings um, w- was at the scene and, and there were other, you know, there were at least 10 or 11 young people there. You can include Jordan as well, 10 or 11, even though only five were charged with murder. Um, Gary Newlove was quite angry um, and it's believed that he was lashing out to, to the young people, the kids, the teenagers. And Adam Swelling said, if you're going to hit one of these, hit someone, hit me, because at least I'm 18, I'm a man, these are, these are kids. Um, then I think as, as far as Adam's concerned, Gary Newlove threw, threw a punch or he kicked, some, kicked out at someone. Who that was, I I have no idea. Um, And Adam jabbed with his left hand, um, jabbed Gary Newlove in the cheek. And at that moment, he either lost his balance or that that jab was what resulted in the uh, movement of the neck and and, and the artery bursting. Um, But as he's falling to the ground, that's when Stephen Sorton kicks him and the kick lands on the neck. So... For me, the argument was always, was it was was it the punch or was it the kick? But either way, you know, Mr. Newlove died uh, yeah, of yeah. these injuries. And, and I, Adam, Adam said, uh, even when he was arrested, he said, you know, I'll plead guilty to manslaughter because if that, that first blow led to this man's death, then I, I'm guilty of that and I plead guilty to manslaughter. Uh, and I think that was fair enough, you know. And even Stephen said, told his mother that it was him that had kicked. And he told mm. her that in the police station. She told the police. So we had two two young people here who had taken responsibility. And in my mind, I you know, looking back now, I think it would have been fair to give them both manslaughter because, you know, that would have, in in, in essence, been a joint enterprise in which but, both... But that, that wasn't what the court decided. But, but Jordan then got caught up in the <clears throat> arrests. He got arrested. Yeah. Yeah, and his brother as well. That you know, five of them were, were charged with murder. Uh, obviously, when when we were going through the trial process, I thought it was about the jury working out what I'd already worked out in the police station, and that evidence being honestly put before a jury. But it it was more about Jordan being at the scene because he was an un, unaware of his exact um, place at the scene when when the incident happened. 
the prosecutor was more concerned about making the jury believe that he was there at the material time of the of the of, of the punch or the kick. Now, for me, and anybody with a logical mind would would think, well, that does that matter because he can't see it. Um, he didn't get involved in it, and he and he couldn't see it. So, I think the whole trial for Jordan was very unfair because, uh, as a blind person, being asked um, <clears throat> who did it, what were they wearing, where was such a body stood, he's not going to be able to answer those questions. So he's not be going to be able to defend himself. So, so how well defendant... established was his uh, was his eyesight problem at that stage? Because well, he had a problem, he'd... but had had he been diagnosed properly? He'd, he'd, he'd gone through all the... He, he couldn't have surgery until he turned 16. Um, and that, that's the requirement. When you turn 16, you can give permission to have surgery. But he'd been booked um, just weeks after his 16th mm. birthday to have an appointment uh, so that he could have, have the surgery. Mm. Now, if he'd gone to that appointment and he wasn't allowed to go to that appointment he would have had his transplant surgery before the trial. And I think if he'd had that surgery before the trial, there'd have been no denying that he was blind and the jury would have known because you don't give transplant surgery to someone that can see. But there was and a dispute the, about whether he actually was blind then. Well, it, it was left to the jury whether they wanted to believe that or not. And I really? think, you know, but it was fact, he was, you know, and and we, we, want, I, we wanted the expert to stand in the courtroom and to explain the condition to the jury. And we wanted that person to explain how Jordan would, would see because we knew that he couldn't do it himself. I mean, the best Jordan could do was to say, you know, when when, <clears throat> when the judge asked him, could he see the, what could he see in the jury? And he said, blobs, you know, <clears throat> it's, it, it, there's more to it. So there's what more happened, to it than that. So what happened with the expert evidence then? Well, the RQC read out slight extracts from 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 the expert but it was quite technical it was quite sort of medical and technical with not point something and you know sort of um mm. I wouldn't understand it you wouldn't understand it you know unless you're um a, a, an expert on vision you know these technical phrases don't mean anything at all so the but expert wasn't actually called to give evidence. He, he wasn't called. He wasn't called. And I, and, and I went to court every day and that was the day that I didn't go. And I actually, it was a number of a number of days or weeks even before I realised that he hadn't actually been called to give evidence. Uh, and I found that quite shocking. And I did argue, you know, we need, you know, can we not have him back in? And, and there was this argument that there wasn't enough time to fit him in and that we'd read part of the medical report to the jury um, but that for me that wasn't good enough that wasn't good the, enough sorry to keep interrupting but were the prosecution disputing the expert evidence were they saying it's not true that he's not blind well it's quite it, it, they're very clever at how they do these things I mean th there was a deal done beforehand that if we didn't call the expert the prosecutor wouldn't challenge Jordan's condition right but in my eyes, he, he challenged that condition every every day. He, um, he 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 definitely challenged it. He didn't say, "I don't believe you can't see." He did it in a way, in a very roundabout way, about telling the jury how how talented he was at football. Um, Jordan wasn't talented at football. You know, if you kicked a football at him, it would bounce off his face, and he couldn't see the ball. Uh, but by doing that and getting you know other people to ask, "What was Jordan like at football?" It made it look as if, well, if, if he's very, if he's adept at football and he's technically great with a the football, then he must be able to see. But these young people were referring to Jordan from years before, not from him at that right. moment in time. Yeah. That's clever, isn't it, to avoid so he the got, reality? He got, so he it's got quite, it's of... quite spiteful that that yeah. man who knows the law and, and, and is intelligent can do that to a child. Yeah. I find it quite spiteful. But he got convicted of murder. The jury decided that he was. This part is under of the joint enterprise. As joint enterprises, yeah. he was there, and therefore he was roped in as a perpetrator. Yeah, I mean the the, the phrase that came up a number of times that um, I hooked onto was the possibility of foresight. 
uh, and that he foresaw um, that what if might Stephen, happen. Yes, what might happen. Yeah. Even if the person that committed the act had no intention. So I found that quite like sort of really, you know, you can you can go to prison for murder because you foresaw what someone didn't know they themselves were going to do. And you couldn't see happening. Uh, like you could well, how can you foresee something, you know, the act the, the 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 next action of someone that you can't see in the first place? It makes no sense. Parents need to know this, don't they, Jan? Pa- parents Absolutely. who got, you know, but boys particularly, you know, who are out and about in the evenings and getting into trouble sometimes. That, yeah. Um, what, you know, can happen? Yeah, well, I, be... I, I always think if you can do this, you know, if this foresight element and, and this kind of conviction can happen to someone who's disabled, then it most certainly can happen to someone who isn't. I mean, we all know that a blind person can kill someone. You know, he does have arms and legs and, he, yeah. you know, he can do that. But he wasn't convicted of the actual murder. He was convicted of, of seeing it. It was a jo- Yeah, he was the secondary, what they call the secondary party. Yeah. Um, and secondary parties get life as well, even if they're not the person that uh, commits the murder or, or, or gets involved with it. So we... I mean, as a campaign group, we have young people who are not even at the scene. So, you know, that that's they can't see it either. No. You know, so no. how can they defend themselves if they're not there and they can't see it either? We just, I'm, I'm we just sure need if... to name the group, actually, that you've mentioned. The group's called? Gemba. It's called Jemba. Yeah, it's called the, the campaign group that uh, I co-founded with another lady is called Jemba, which, which stands for Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association. Right, that's fine. Yeah, and we, because had... Jordan, Jordan, because people shouldn't be found guilty by association; that they should be found by by real evidence. Well, I I imagine um, Jan that if people read a lot of what the newspapers were saying yeah. at the time, and they just take a kind of cursory look at it, they will believe that Jordan was part of the three people who were convicted, and they they all jointly killed the man. Yes. Did yes. something to kill that man. Yeah. And, and I mean, your your argument is Jordan was not, did not kick him, punch him, do anything physically towards him, isn't even placed next to Gary New Love, but he can go to, he can get convicted <laughs> of murder and he can end up in prison with the other yeah. two. Yeah. I mean, jo- Jordan, Jordan wasn't even wearing shoes at the time. So, even the pathologist said if it was Jordan that had delivered the kick with an unshod foot, there would be bruises to his feet. Um, so if he'd been kicking the victim or punching the victim, there'd be there'd be bruises on his hands and there'd be bruises on his feet. And there wasn't. So, But nobody really um, tried to assert that he had uh, struck a blow, did they? It seemed to be well, a, a different argument. There, there was a little argument that because there was a shoe found under the victim's neck and because Jordan wasn't wearing shoes um there was a little bit of sort of only during the police station interview that it could have mm-hmm. been Jordan's shoe mm-hmm. and and it, it was established pretty early on that it wasn't because it, it was a sort of a size 10 and Jordan was a size 5 well uh, and, um, and it was established whose shoe that was so it wasn't that he was it wasn't implicated Jordan's in shoe, delivering yeah. the blow that's the, <laughs> yeah, the point it's yeah. definitely the joint enterprise argument isn't it yes so he gets a life sentence and um with a minimum of uh, is it it 12 with a minimum of 12 years years. yes so we have a 15 year old boy who's blind who's been given a life sentence for being associated with this murder but the the other the other two the other two one got 17 years was that right yeah The, the 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 most the one who did the worst i suppose we could say well the one who the one who who did who did the jab to the face, um, he got the most because he was eighteen at the time. Okay, and did he get seventeen years, a minimum of seventeen? He, he was given he was given a minimum of seventeen. And, and the other one, the boy, a minimum the of fifteen. The boy that delivered the yeah, the boy that delivered the kick was originally given fifteen. That was reduced right. to thirteen, and then reduced to twelve. And right. Jordan got well, a minimum 12. of what? Twelve. Twelve. 
Well, so so in, in essence, both Stephen and Jordan were given the same minimum life tariff. Yeah. Right. So a 15, what was he when he got um, to the police station, was he kept in custody or did he yeah. have a period on ba- on bail? He wasn't given bail. No, he was sent to okay. various sort of prisons up and down the country. I mean, the first one was Hindley Remand and the governor there said, you know, this isn't the right. This 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 child needs has special needs and we can't cater for him. He was then sent to Hassett Fields and, and there was a lot of intervention there saying, we can't have him here. We've got lots of steps and, and corridors. And again, he can't navigate this prison and we can't let look after him. He's got, got too many needs that we can't cater for. Um, and then he was placed in Red Bank, which is quite, quite close to Warrington, which was a very smaller unit, a very much child sort of friendly and could cater for him. You know, we, we went from August to November, which which was three months from incident to trial. And m- the main thing that we were fighting for was to put Jordan in a place where he was safe yeah. rather than trying to find uh, rather than trying to find out how to um, give him the best defense. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, I mean, at, at one point he was so far away. It was it was a huge journey for me to go to see him, to talk to him, and, to, and 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 try to help him, as well as for his legal team. So he was sort of removed from 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 his legal team and and his family. So it, it it was very difficult, and that was a huge fight for us before we even set foot into the courtroom. So the the day of the incident, he gets arrested, and he is in prison from that moment onwards. From that night onwards, yes. And he served the entire 12 years, am I right? Yeah, yep. and, be- and beyond. And beyond. So he's released now, isn't he? But, yes. But Thank- in total, thankfully. yeah. In total, how many years did he serve? Was it 12 and a just half? A, or? Just, over thir- just over 13. Okay. Yeah. When we did get the, the go ahead about his release, uh, for some reason, they'd no longer got a bed in, a, in an approved premises. So. We had to sort of, <laughs> yeah, uh, but there were there were approved premises, and because I intervened and we went to the Secretary of State and said, "Look, I've just done some research, and I know that there's X amount of beds available in the country." So, uh, again, another argument, have it, you know, which didn't need to be to be had, uh, but he was thankfully released before Christmas, uh, two thousand and twenty. Okay, so he's released, but he's subject to various restrictions, isn't he? You, you've told us about that. Yeah, we, we always knew there would be restrictions and that he'd have to follow a licence, uh, because when you do get a life sentence, it, it is 99 years and you are subject to a, to a licence that's put, 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 um, that's put in place by the parole board. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the extent of this licence is huge. Uh, I looked, I tried to, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a, a geographer or, a, you know, I, I, but I tallied up as best I could what the square miles of, 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 of this restriction zone was. And, it, and, and for me, it, it totaled over a thousand square miles. Um, so you, you've sent us some, some maps which we're, we'll put with the video, Jan, but it's, it's the entirety of Cheshire, is that right? The and whole, beyond, yes. Yeah, yeah. The whole of Cheshire. We've got parts of Manchester. Yeah, and, and Greater and, Manchester. Yeah. And parts of London. Yeah, and, and Wigan as well. We've got, you know, we've not... Um, which not only means that if he's in Manchester, he can't get to Liverpool, you know. So it's sort of, it's like a chunk of land that prevents him from going from one side of the country to the other. And that chunk of land is where all of his connections are, his family connections, his work connections, his friendship circle. Um, so he's he's quite quite isolated because of them. Now, the licence um, said, it, this is true, isn't it? The licence said that he could, if he asked, uh, they could decide whether, whether it was appropriate or not, but he could ask to come and visit family and friends. In these areas, is, is yeah, that right? and he's done that. Yeah, yeah, he, he's asked for permission. Yes, um, and he's has been he, has refused he been, it every time. 
he's been refused every single time. Um, he, he asked if he could come to my house at Christmas and he asked sort of about six weeks in advance. And he, again, he was refused. Uh, and he's asked about his grandparents and again, refused. But um, they came back to him and said they need, he needs, you know, at least six weeks in advance when he asked permission to go somewhere. Now, you know, my, my parents are in their 80s. They don't want to ask if he can come for tea six weeks in advance. You know, we, we've got a family that, you know, if, if, if I've, I've got family that live in different parts of the country and, and they don't necessarily decide to come to Wigan and visit my parents six weeks in advance. It, it could be a week or, you know, a matter of days or whatever. And they all want to see him again, but they can't because, you know, mm. everything has to be so far in advance that it just doesn't work for us. And, and we also feel that even if he did ask for six in six weeks in advance, they'd still say no. You know, it, it's I'm not so I'm not so bothered about it, him not coming to me because I'm quite capable of catching a train and going to see him. But my parents have got mobility issues and, and, they're, and they're getting older and they still haven't had the opportunity. So you live, you live in one of these forbidden zones. I, I live in a forbidden zone. Yeah. And I'm I mean, I came back to Warrington because towards the end of his sentence, <clears throat> It was verbalised that he, you know, that they would work towards letting him come home, even if it was only for six months, you know, just to get him back into to, to, to normal living so that I could take care of him. And that was verbalised. So I moved back into the into the family home because it had been rented out previously and, and at great expense in, in the in the in the thoughts that this he would come back here for a while. Um, <clears throat> but then. Um, it became obvious that wasn't going to happen. So I, I could get my head around that, but what I can't get my head around is that every single member of my family in Wigan, they're an exclusion zone as well. It's almost like their postcodes have been picked out of a hat um, and they fit. There are a lot of postcodes zone. in the list of forbidden postcodes, yeah. aren't there? Yeah, I and mean, they're hundreds. All sort of where family, yeah. There are places in Wigan where we can go, where there are no family members. Yeah. But where every single family member lives, he can't go. So Which, where is he living? What what's he, what kind of accommodation is he in? He lives in an apartment in central Manchester and it's massively expensive because that's what central Manchester is. Hmm. Um, and are you and having it, to fund that, Jan? Or we're he... all having to fund it, yes, to some degree. I mean, he has a job at the moment and he's got this huge stress that even though he has a full-time job, um, he's not able to meet. He can meet the rent, but he can't feed himself as well. So it's very, very difficult, very difficult. So as a family, and we have to support him financially as well at this moment in time. Now, if he was living, if he had a choice of where to live, there's a possibility that he could, he could be paying rent that's half the size yeah. and he'd be able to feed himself. And he'd be able to get a job as well because he has to find out if he's if he if he's able to go to particular zones in and around the Manchester area. Yeah, so, in order to work. Yeah. Yeah, in order to go to work. And and mm -hmm. and the job he's doing at the moment means he the sites change. Mm -hmm. So if right. you know, if if by next week they're working a job in a different area of Manchester and probation say, well, you haven't given us six weeks in advance. Or, you know, that's an exclusion, so no, you can't go there. Then he's jobless again. And you were saying that he was on level three uh, in prisoner Risk. terms. Um, what, what does that mean? <clears throat> sort of, you're the most high-risk released prisoner. So okay. I would imagine people who are paedophiles and terrorists. Or on level three. Uh, or serial killers, yeah, will and be what, on level, uh, level He has three. been reduced from that, though. It's recently, recently been reduced, yeah. After over a year of sort of not breaching his licence um, <clears throat> and doing everything that, that's required of him. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, he was on, he was on um, a tag for over, for, for about nine or ten months rather than six. He should have been on it for six months, but they, they, they didn't remove it. Was and that, that, a, was that a GPS-type tag to yeah, see yeah, where he so was? It, 
yeah, to yeah. see where he was. But that was quite nerve wracking for him because because the exclusion zones are quite close to where he is. Mm. He was never fully aware of whether he could be stepping out of that zone or not, which would mean straight to prison. You know, not committing a crime. You you just walk down the wrong side of the road, yeah. or you've caught a bus that's gone down the wrong. Well, actually, he can't catch a bus. He's not allowed to catch pub- public transport because. You just don't know the route of the bus, but probation were unable to give him a, di- a, a definitive route that he can travel in. So even they didn't know. Yeah, it sounds a, a to me. Would, would you, is this unreasonable of me to say it sounds like he was set up to fail? You know. Yes. I, Do you feel yes. he's been treated worse than other people in the same well, situation? Yeah, and, and I can. You know, we've. Jordan's actually argued that with his probation officer that he's treated differently to others and probation claimed that he's no different to anyone else. But because of Jengba, I, I know of lots of other young people yeah. uh, in similar circumstances to him that have been released and released back to the parental home. Well, he knows of people who have committed heinous crimes. Um, he knows the people who were the actual perpetrator he knows someone who wielded a knife and used it and they've gone back to the family home and the area in which it happened he knows that because he's been in prison with these people I know I know people who have been involved in a joint enterprise because of the campaign who've been released and they some of them have not even been released on a tag and some of them have no restriction zones whatsoever they can go you know, back to the family home, go visit family um, and friends and even go to the area in which the, 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 the incident happened. So, so what's the best argument you've heard yet for, for why he needs to be treated as such a dangerous um, um, prisoner? Well, we, we are working with, with, with a legal team trying to find out what this is. And, and, and it feel, it, the only thing that comes back to us is that the family fear not fear that he's going to harm them, but fear that they might bump into them. You don't um, mean your family, whilst... do you? I don't think. No, no. Uh, his, yeah, it, it's there. It's it, the new love family. Uh, who are the new love family? They're the victims. The victims' family. The, his his daughters and his wife. So, so who is his new wife? Love, Baroness yeah, Newlove. Baroness, is it? Yeah, Baroness Newlove will put to the parole board um, what her fears are and her thoughts, but. It's always undisclosed, so we don't know what these are. So you know she's done it, though, we can Do you? are told that she has made some kind of... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so just tell us, who, this... who is she? Who is Baroness Newlove? Well, um, Helen Newlove, after, after, after her husband was, was tragically murdered, um, met up with quite a number of MPs, Gordon Brown, Jack Straw, David Cameron, and, you know, it became... That's when it became broken britain it was quite political uh and the case was used by by the tory government and the story was being sort of repeated in the press as part of the broken broken britain rhetoric uh and uh, she was rewarded uh with a place in the house of lords and and a position of power she then became the victims commissioner of england and wales and is she so, still that, or is she, is she finished? She with that? she retired. I believe she she was that for 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 ten years, and she retired more or less the year that Jordan was released. So her job as victims commissioner ended as my son's conviction for murder ended. So as it, as know, victims commissioner, she would have a lot of connections with um, probation <laughs> and uh, other agencies involved with well, release of prisoners. Our argument. Our argument always has to go back to the Secretary of State, which is the Minister of Justice, um, <clears throat> who, who who appears to support these undisclosed um, statements that Mrs Newlove makes. But our argument is, how can we challenge something that we don't know is being said? Uh, and, and we can't because we don't know what's in that document. And and it becomes a sort of you're sort of going round in circles trying to work out what it is, but you can't because you can't see it. You can't you can't you can't try to even understand what it is. You know, I, I'd like to try to understand how she feels and why she feels the way she does, um, and so that we can put her mind at rest. 
I don't believe if any of the new love family saw Jordan, they would even know who he, who he is. He doesn't look like the 15-year-old boy that stood in the trial. I don't think anyone would recognise him. So but if he just, caught if he caught a train to Wigan and they were sat on the train, one he probably wouldn't recognise them, and they certainly wouldn't recognise him. Uh, but it takes and, an unusual person to be able to elevate themselves from the wife of a victim to a member of the House of Lords and a a, a national leading figure in victim support. That's an unusual progress yes. for a person to make any anybody so you clearly are a person who's to be able to achieve that you have to be a person who's able to uh, influence people and um, impress them with your arguments and your uh, your ability to, to put yourself forward as a spokesman or as a leader of uh, opinions I, I don't I don't think uh, without without sort of sounding um I think I think she she I don't think she chose to be that person. I think she was chosen. That's not um, really how things work because there are plenty of victims around the the world who yeah. who aren't chosen and yeah. who don't yeah. meet well, the I, prime I, minister. I, I, or, would, or, I, I would argue that as well. But um, by 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 the Tory government hanging on to this case and using and politicising it. Um, and having it on the front pages of every newspaper for as long as it was humanly possible. Um, <clears throat> that they, they won votes, you know. Uh, she helped in that way, uh, whether that was a conscious decision or not. But perhaps even my son helped in, in, in some way by being convicted, by proving to the country that, you know, there was this, if you read the newspapers from back to, in 2007, the, the Sun and the Daily Mail are just covered with uh, mm -hmm. broken Britain, feral youth, my son's face. Um, what are we going to do about it? Uh, bring back the death sentence. There's no doubt that it's true, of course, that the media and politicians will use people to achieve something which they see as important. But people mm -hmm. who are used like that aren't doing it unconsciously no and you have to you have to willingly collaborate um, yeah. and and ride the ride the wave of of uh, public interest and enthusiasm yeah. and if it ends up that you become a baroness and um you know a national leading figure and you hold that position for a decade or more then clearly it's not an accident that that happens to you i, mm. I think you're being very generous jan <laughs> yeah I, yeah I think there's an issue which, which I mean, you know, Jill and I would talk about and you may have an opinion about, but we are hearing a lot of news at the moment about um, privileged elites yeah. being able to behave in ways which are different from the rest of the population. Yeah. And, um, uh, and this feels very like a, one of these, an example of this kind of thinking, where once you're on an, in an inner circle, somewhere to do with government mm -hmm. or somewhere to do with these central institutions of the country, mm -hmm. You, you can be somehow different from everybody yeah. else and you're entitled to well, demand, it, it, uh, you know, different um, privileges from everybody yeah, else. Yeah, you I, sort of exist on a different level, don't you? Yeah. Mm. Yes. yeah. I don't I think, think it's, it's not necessarily for you to, to, to push that because obviously your position's a precarious one with yeah. Jordan's yes, interest Yes, and you want Jordan's interest to be... Yeah. But listening to your story, that's very much the impression that I have that mm -hmm. that you, you know you're being very generous in your judgment about Baroness well, I've, New Love. I've, I've always thought that the better the better story to have come from what happened that night would be to <clears throat> I mean Mrs New Love to me missed the greatest trick of all. This was a, a a single blow death, and I think that would have been a much more important message for the public and for young people that you can kick or punch someone once and not intend them to die, but they can. And I think that was a, was a, was a greater message. That but was a bigger But there's another message, which is that if you're a blind boy of 15 and you're somewhere near where something bad happens, you, you can be persecuted for life by yeah. privileged people who choose to have it in for you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's another that's, story. Yeah, yeah. and I think, I think the fact that I fought for Jordan. He's maintained his innocence all of this time. But I fought. I fought not just for Jordan, but I fought for lots of other people as well. And and the campaign group 
took the law <clears throat> to the Supreme Court with one of one of the cases that we supported, and it and it won. You mm -hmm. know, the judges mm -hmm. acknowledged that that the law had taken a wrong turn in 2000, not 2000, 1984, 32 years of injustice, you know, and that was taken there because I'd seen what happened to my son. <clears throat> and although I would have preferred it to, to have been his case that went there and it would have been a much stronger case, it, you know, that it, it's exactly the same thing. So yes. I, I don't, I, what I don't understand is why, these two women are pitched against each other when in reality, if we want equality and fairness and a, and a decent justice system, then there needs to be honesty and the collaboration will be far more powerful. Well, you have to take that position and say, well, why haven't we got that? And the answer is people aren't looking for fairness or honesty. Mm. They're looking for power and influence. Mrs. Newlove got an answer in 2008. She got a verdict. She got three life sentences. You know, was that not enough? No, nope. she want Obviously more than not. Three, three. You know, <laughs> Clearly I, not. I would imagine anyone who, who who sort of platforms themselves as a person who wants equality and justice for everyone would consider it, it, it quite, you know, it quite right to have got one conviction for the person that did what they did, you know. But you judge that, people by what they do. And justice is more important. You have than, to judge than, people than by what they do. And if what they do is is a, a crazy, exaggerated response to a situation uh, or, a, or a misjudged, unbalanced response to a situation, then that's who they are. Yeah. You can only and, and judge well, people and by what they do. It, it, it's quite understandable. If you, if you are a bereaved victim, you're quite understandable like you'd want everyone to go to prison and and even that wouldn't be enough for you but it doesn't mean you're right doesn't mean that no, your I, I... emotional state like to feel that way that's why we have a justice system because yeah. it's supposed to intervene with your passion yeah. you know mrs new love wanted the death sentence she she was on the front page of the sun newspaper saying that she'd administer the lethal injection you know she she pulled the cord that hangs them herself you know? Yeah, she yeah. would do that. Yeah, she would do that herself. You know, Even I find that quite, I find that quite appalling. That, but, but she's grieving, and they had and a she's problem upset. recruiting executioners. So here <laughs> yeah, we have a volunteer that, in the House of Lords. Yeah, I mean, she probably only wanted to do my son Adam and Stephen, but she was, you know, that was on the front pages of the newspapers. But I see that as someone whose utter grief has taken over common sense. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that's why the justice system isn't supposed to take too seriously someone's utter grief yeah. and, and put it into a, into the system. But we're not talking we about the justice have... system. We're talking about uh, a, an establishment system in which people are able to wield influence well, she's uh, because they're privileged of, she's, and yeah, an elite. She's become a part of that now. She's become a part exactly. of that. Mm. Um, and I don't believe someone can become a part of that with such... Um, extreme views that Sorry. those views are too extreme to be part of our justice system yeah. um, because the most people the majority of people in this country would be appalled if we had a death penalty again particularly yeah. a death penalty to children which is what she was calling <laughs> absolutely for. I think absolutely. That, that would be <laughs> astonishing yeah so, so Jan of the restrictions imposed on Jordan he no longer has the tag from, from yeah. he so he leaves <clears throat> prison and he has a tag, but no longer the tag. But but it sounds like all the other restrictions have not changed. Is that right? Since he left so the, prison, I think we're still sort of in the process legally getting this sorted out. But right. um, he was always told that he could travel down certain roads to get from one place to another, but probation always refused it. So we've now got to the point where the parole board have come back and said no probation you're wrong he can travel down these roads because realistically you know what is the chances that if he sat in the back seat of a car traveling down down the road from you know in a road through Cheshire that Mrs Newlove's going to be traveling up the road and spot him in the back seat of the car yeah you know it's it's it's, it's probably a billion to one chance mm. if, if not more but um They've said 
that no, he can do that if he's in. These are the roads we said. We said in the in the in the license agreement that he can travel down them. He can stop to to, to refuel or to use the toilet. Um, so that's been that's been sorted out. But for for over twelve months, he's been told that he can't even do that. So it, he's had to go around. If he has to go somewhere, he's had to travel huge amounts of miles to get somewhere that he could probably get to in half an hour. Uh, but he's, he's 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 done as he's told. Even though we knew it was wrong, we still obeyed. You know, yeah. whatever whatever the probation officer said, even though we knew she was she was incorrect in in what she was saying. Uh, and we've gone down the legal route to prove yeah. that we are right, and and and, yeah. and we will do that. We will we will do it legally because that's that's what we believe. If if this is a law and this is what you tell us we have to do, then we'll we'll do it and we'll fight it. Yeah. So, so that's going on, and hopefully his risk will reduce even more as time goes by. Because as long as he keeps his nose, you know, clean and and everything is uh, okay, he doesn't. His risk assessment, not his actual risk. With his risk assessment, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, he's, Jordan's no Jordan's no risk to anyone. No, you know, I'm not suggesting no he is, Jan. But um, no. I think, but one of the things that needs to be accepted is if if he doesn't have a job. And it, and he ends up becoming homeless, and he's got no family ties, and he can't stay with family. Then he will become a risk because, yeah. you know, when someone has no money, nowhere to live, no one to speak to, that's when they might commit a crime, and that's when you might create a new victim. So, you know, it, it beggars belief that he's being put in a position where where he's you know squoze so tightly that we could end up with another crime happening because of what the system's doing to him not because that's what he wants yeah. to do yeah. he should be being supported not not being squoze to within an inch of his life yeah. um, and it's only because he has got family and he has got friends that that he's being taken care of and that there must be lots of young people being released from prison who have no one to turn to and if this was happening to them you know no wonder the revolving door yeah you know They've created a revolving door. Yeah. And, and and it's, you know, it's totally unfair. People need support. Of course they do. And I, you know, we've got, we've got, as a family, we've got support in abundance, but we're not allowed to give it to him. You know, we have to travel a long way and my parents can't do that. He's not allowed to come and get, get support from us in our own homes. Mm. So it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's like whatever the government says should be, the complete opposite. Is happening for Jordan. Mm. 